Great. Good. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Happy Tuesday. On today's stated agenda, we'll be voting on the following land use items. 515 Blake Avenue, a series of applications to, to, to facilitate the development of approximately 500 affordable units of housing, 50%, which will be affordable to people earning uh, below 50% of AMI, including 30% of the units being for uh, currently or formerly homeless individuals and a significant supportive housing component to the project as well in Councilmember Barron's district. We have 101 Fleet Place, which will provide for the construction of a 14-story commercial office building in Majority Leader Lori Cumbo's district. Uh, the council will be restoring the originally proposed zoning in order to facilitate the retention of a daycare center in the new development. Moving on, the council will be voting on the following piece of legislation. We, first, we have a transportation bill up for a vote by council member uh, Bob Holden. Proposed introduction number 1412A, sponsored by council member Robert Holden, would provide that the police department tow trucks, that police department tow trucks may remove unintended vehicles that are obstructing a sidewalk, crosswalk, fire hydrant, uh, bike lane, or bus lane if the vehicle poses a threat to safety or inhibit the safe and expeditious passage of MTA buses. The bill would also require the police department to issue a report in January of 2021 that includes for each month in 2020 the number of vehicles towed disaggregated by police precinct. And I invite Councilmember Holden to come up and speak on his bill. Thank you, Speaker. And I, again, I thank you for your leadership on the placard abuse uh, uh, bills, the package. It's very, very important. This, this one will make, uh, 1412 will make our streets much, much safer. Right now, in my district and in many districts around the city of New York, we have cars blocked in crosswalks, fire hydrants, bus lanes, bike lanes, you name it. And the way I started this, uh, this started actually in March of 2018, I had, right in front of my new office on Dry Harbor Road in Middle Village, we had a car blocking a hydrant. And we had it ticketed every day of the week, but they would not tow it. Police said, we don't, we don't do that, you know, we can, but you know, it took me a week to get it towed, but it was a lot of pressure. So I said, this is ridiculous. We need to have uh, some, safety has to be pri the priority. Not if you park 10 minutes over at a muni meter and then you get towed for that. We need to prioritize safety. And this, this bill does that, and I thank the speaker for his leadership, co-sponsoring. And again, the reporting part of it is very, very essential that we get the actual numbers of, of the cars towed that are endangering our pedestrians and bicyclists around the city of New York. So I want to thank the speaker again for his wonderful leadership on this placard bill, um, abuse bill. And by the way, I just want to state for the, for the record that we have a lot of this uh, these violations around police precincts that are blocking crosswalks, fire hydrants, and so on. So that is going to be a priority uh, for the city of New York and for our, the council. Thank you so much, Speaker. Thanks, Thanks Bob. Congratulations. Uh, second, we have a piece of housing and buildings legislation, introduction number 1481A, sponsored by our housing committee chair, uh, Robert Cornegie, would amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to bringing the New York City building code up to date with the 2015 edition of the International Building Code published by the International Code Council. The law would bring the code up to date to include differences that reflect the unique character of the city and repealing chapter 11 and appendices C, F, and G of the New York City Public uh, Plumbing Code in, in, uh, in relation thereto. Uh, I'd like to thank Councilmember Cornegie, and if he comes in, I'm happy to have him speak. Next, we have two governmental operations bills. Introduction 1095, sponsored by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, would increase transparency within the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals, the BSA, and ensure uh, granted temporary special permits don't go on indefinitely. The bill does the following. It requires the BSA to notify building owners when a special permit is about to expire. Such notification must go out six months before the special permit expires. Because use of such property after the special permit's expiration may be in violation of the building's certificate of occupancy, the BSA's notification must inform the owner that a special permit may not be extended until any penalties for such violation are paid. And lastly, it requires 
that such notification be sent to the community board where the property is located. This bill, this bill builds on Local Law 84 of 2017, which required the BSA to provide similar notification when a variance to the zoning resolution is about to expire. And the next bill is Introduction 1249B, also sponsored by the chair of our government uh, operations committee, Chair Cabrera, and it would eliminate the critical driver program, a redundant and confusing New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission program that is operated in the same manner as the persistent violator program. Uh, these programs uh, are sort of du duplicative, but the only non-duplicative element of the critical driver program is that it allows drivers to reduce accumulated license points through DMV accident prevention courses. The persistent violator program lets drivers reduce points through TLC accident prevention courses. This bill would consolidate <clears throat> the points reduction elements into the persistent violator program, thus allowing drivers to reduce accumulated points through DMV and TLC accident prevention courses. These programs were separate until Local Law of 20, uh, Local Law 30 of 2014 as an element of the Mayor's Vision Zero Action Plan, and it included both T TLC and DMV issued points under the Persistent Violator Program. However, according to the TLC, this caused very significant confusion for drivers, many of whom they th thought they were being penalized twice for the same violation. It's confusing. I'm happy to uh, uh, try to explain it further, but we're basically consolidating these programs so it's one program now, now not multiple programs. And finally, the council will be voting on a really important piece of legislation aimed at reducing the number of bird deaths throughout the city. This is a significant step in protecting our feathered friends and making New York a more animal-friendly city. It's estimated that between 90,000 and 230,000 birds are killed annually in New York City as a result of building collisions. This number is so high because birds are unable to detect and avoid glass because uh, artificial night lighting confounds night migrating species and New York City is a major flyover. We have, we're, we're part of the Atlantic uh, migratory flyover. Uh, introduction number 1482B, sponsored by Councilman Rafael Espinal Jr., would require 90% of the building envelope for the first 75 feet of any new building or any building that is proposed to undergo major alterations to be constructed of bird-friendly materials that meet a specified design standard that is intended to, increase, to decrease bird strikes. This bill would also require the installation of these bird-friendly materials where an exterior wall envelope is adjacent to a green roof system uh, or on certain installations that create hazards for birds, such as glass awnings, handrails, windbreak panels, acoustic barriers, and parallel glass panels. This local law would take effect one year after a one year after we voted in, uh, and it would not apply to applications for construction document approval filed before the effective date. Uh, Rob, did you want to say anything quickly on the, the no on the on the uh, building code? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Speaker. <clears throat> so today, the council obviously will vote on uh, my bill intro 1481A, which will amend the New York City Plumbing Code to bring it up to date with the 2015 International Plumbing Code. I'd like to thank the Housing and Buildings Committee staff and technical experts that helped craft this complete piece of legislation. This revision process involved nearly 650 professionals participating in 14 technical and advisory, advisory and managing committees. Participants on these committees included architects, engineers, and members of the construction industry, labor, real estate, and government. The plumbing code is the first construction code to be heard during this code cycle, and it's incredibly important toward the work that keeps this great city moving forward. One of the most interesting parts of being chair of housing and buildings is learning about the importance of the construction code and the impact that rules and regulations like the plumbing code have. This code is essential to protecting the health and well-being of New Yorkers, ensuring that water and sewage flows in a way that doesn't impact our quality of life. Advances in the plumbing code protect us from unsanitary conditions that result in sickness and in some serious cases, even death. I want to, I want to take this moment to highlight the plumbers of the great city and commend them for the work that they do to maintain piping systems in buildings and through New York. They're vital to maintaining the infrastructure that keeps our city moving forward, especially as New York becomes a more and more desirable place to live. I want to thank uh, Speaker Corey Johnson for his uh, always foresight and vision in and around housing and buildings issues and his willingness to allow this committee to work on behalf of the city and its residents. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Thanks.
Thanks, Rob. Uh, and Emily, I want to uh, welcome you. It's good to see you here back at City Hall. Uh, so I'm happy to first uh, take any on topic questions. Katie. I think this is from Councilman Holden and his bill with the tolling. I know the concern with both the council and then the mayor's clock reviews is that you can't really trust the police to ticket their own more clock reviewers. I mean, is there a concern that an NYPD tow truck driver will see a cop with like a placard, whether it's real or fake, and say, no, nah, I'll let that guy go? But that's why we have the oversight. And, and again, they have to report monthly. And I guess we can actually ask how many cops were ticketed um, or towed. But I think that's going to be the challenge here. And well, it remains to be seen. But it's a very, very important component of it. And because placard abuse is placard abuse, period, no matter who's doing it. And especially the police should actually you know, uphold the law and, and abide by the law. So that's why these, these, uh, the placard abuse bills are very, very important. And we'll see what happens. I mean, it will be probably a slower process, but it's up to the city council to over with the oversight, certainly. Yeah, Joe. Um, so I want to get your opinion on the East and North Market. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I think is really, really important, and one of the uh, deficiencies, I think, of the mayor's plan on building new shelters, I think we do need new shelters, is actually we also need to build deeply affordable housing and supportive housing as well. And so this project uh, is going to include 500 units of affordable housing with a 30% set aside for people coming out of shelter and half of the project for people earning less than 50% of AMI. That's very low income housing for people in that community. And so the hope in each of these communities is that we're supposed to be building shelters in communities uh, to serve the people who are homeless in those communities. But at the same time, we need to be building permanent, supportive, affordable, low-income housing to actually move those people out of shelter and into housing. And this project achieves building a significant amount of supportive housing and deeply affordable housing to hopefully move a significant number of those families and individuals out of the shelter and into permanent housing that is much better for them. So th I think that that is a win as part of this project. You know, I don't uh, negotiate every land use project here. If I did, I wouldn't do anything else. Um, so the local members have a lot of say. And all along, Councilor Barron said she wanted permanent, deeply affordable, supportive housing to actually help the people that are currently in the shelter. And that's what this project does. Andy. You know, I, I think one of the big issues here on homelessness is that so many of the measures that have been taken have been sort of temporary band-aids to help stem the tide that we're seeing and do not do enough as it relates to long-term forward-thinking solutions that actually significantly decrease homelessness. And so one of the big issues when you talk to all the providers that do this work across the city, and they say it to Albany, and they say it to us, is that you need to increase the voucher, uh, the, the rental assistance voucher. The rental assistance voucher right now for people that are currently in shelter or are trying to get out of shelter isn't high enough to actually afford them an apartment in New York City. And so I think that New Yorkers should be able to continue to live here if they're homeless, if they had a bankruptcy, if they had a health scare, if they were evicted, if something happened to them which uh, was the root of their homelessness, I think ultimately we need to be building, as I just spoke about, uh, 
low income, supportive housing, targeted housing for homeless individuals and their families. And that's what I think we need to be doing. That's what my focus would be on is actually doing that. One of the big things we need from the state legislature this upcoming session, and the city should do it, I think in tandem with the legislature, is looking at increasing the voucher, the rental assistance voucher. That is one of the things we need to see happen because right now, so many people have that voucher and they can't get into housing. And of course, when you go to Newark, the housing's cheaper. But if you gave people a voucher that actually paid for their apartment here, they may actually be able to stay in New York City and have the services that we provide here in New York City. Well, we're looking, we're talking about that. One of the problems is it is hundreds of millions of dollars, literally. And in the past, this has been a shared responsibility between the city and the state. We've typically done these things together. And so I think that we should increase it, but I think that the state legislature needs to partner with us to come up with that amount. And ultimately, should we have a conversation about doing it on our own? Maybe, but we need to first engage with the state legislature uh, on seeing if they'll partner with us to do this. And that's what I think the best course of action is. Any other on topic questions? Yeah, Gloria. There's, no, there's nothing in the bill that states you have to separate the police from just anybody parking in, in that area. But placard abuse is part of a, a, a whole package, and this is part of that. And uh, we, the city council will be on top of that to, to make sure that police cars or, you know, they're private cars, and if they're parking on the sidewalks or at hydrants, they will be towed. And if they're not, we need to know why and why they're allowed to, uh, to, to park there for days on end. Go around any precinct, especially in Queens. I mean, I, you know, I've seen precincts, but it is um, a free-for-all around the precincts, and I think that needs to stop. Uh, why, do, why, do, why can they block um, crosswalks and fire hydrants? And I think that's the question New Yorkers have to ask, and that's the question we're going to keep asking in the city council under the leadership of uh, Corey Johnson. But this is a very, very important aspect of it. it, it the the, the uh, parking around the precincts is atrocious now, and that needs to change. Jeff? Well, you left a bill out because we also did a bill on uh, not allowing the illegal trapping of pigeons in New York City by throwing nets over them. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, I'm an animal lover. Um, you know, I uh, want us to be a humane city that takes care of people and animals. I don't know of any other bills that are in the pipeline. Um, we wanted to have this bill be part of the previous package, but we were still working on some technical aspects of it, which is why it wasn't part of the package and why we're voting on it today. <coughs> so um, this is very technical, and, and uh, uh, Jeff, jump in, or staff, jump in if I, if I get this wrong. So the, the, um, they have a threat factor on the glass, on the glass material. There are certain things you can do by glazing the glass, by putting decals on the glass, by building the glass in a very transparent way that is much easier for birds to handle. And so uh, existing buildings are existing buildings. It would be far too expensive and not possible to go back and renovate existing buildings that are currently doing this. But for new buildings, uh, we are going to require that they use glass and other potential methods to uh, have materials that are much less likely to have bird strikes. And so that's number one. Number two is on the 75 feet, I believe that most of the collisions are happening under 75 feet because they're seeing the reflection of trees and they're seeing the reflection of other things and that is why they strike at that level. Am I getting this right? Okay. Uh, so I think that's, that's one of the, the reasons why the 75 foot issue uh, is in there and also we're looking at the threat factor on glass. Those are two of the big issues that we're contemplating here.
There, the hope is, um, is it Toronto that just did this? Which city just, Toronto? Tor so a bunch of cities are now adopting this. And right now there are not a significant number of manufacturers that specialize in this. The hope is when you have other big cities that put this requirement on, it's going to increase production of this and would hopefully bring costs down. And we think that other cities are gonna follow us. Right now, um, we don't think that there are uh, probably the number that is necessary for the long term. In the short term, there would be enough glass. But the hope is that now that the need is there, other companies that specialize in glass manufacturing are now going to make this part of their portfolio because there's going to be a need and desire for it. Rich? There's a, um, there are a few things. Uh, the Audubon Society uh, has a reporting mechanism where they have volunteers uh, and they are part of a consortium with other groups that do this, that go out and they identify uh, birds that have been struck. Um, I can tell you every day if you look at Twitter, I get tagged and other council members get tagged of people who are seeing literally dead birds uh, and dead birds because they've struck a glass building. Um, and, and there's a great organization called the Wild Bird Fund, which is one of my favorite organizations in New York City on the Upper West Side. And they, for free, take care of any type of bird that has been injured through a bird strike or another type of uh, injury. And they count birds as well that they determine have been uh, caused significant injury because they've struck uh, glass. So there's a variety, and then they try to, the, you know, there's some probably complicated uh, equation that they use to derive that range of numbers that I listed. But we uh, are a major uh, migratory flyover route. And you've seen the last few years what happens on 9-11 with turning off the lights because it causes confusion for the birds and the number of birds that get off their trail, uh, off their migratory pattern because of those lights. There are things we can do to be a more sensitive city. These are some, I think, good measures to actually be able to do that. Anyone else on topic? The the yeah, the Twin Towers. So now, I don't know if you saw, the New York Times did a very big, great article about the number of folks that, uh, that are working with the folks who turn the lights on, where they shut them off for a certain number of minutes, and they turn them back on, and they shut them off so birds can resume their flight pattern without because they get stuck in the lights. They get so confused and stuck at night. And so they figured out a way to still have the lights go up to mark a somber and important occasion for the city of New York, while at the same time turning them off for a certain number of minutes so it doesn't confuse the birds and cause injury. Anyone else on birds? Okay, off topic. <laughs> Yes, Katie. I wanted to um, ask your thoughts on the bill that will be approved today by council members Borelli and Matteo on the uh, death their bill would be to create a new committee for Staten Island to possibly secede from the city. Just your thoughts on the bill and the possibility of Staten Island um, you taking down that Staten Island flag. <laughs> you know, we uh, have uh, lived through this before, and um, I wasn't around for it, but. You know, I think it would be really sad if uh, Staten Island wasn't part of New York City because Staten Island, I think, is an amazing, wonderful part of New York City. I was on Staten Island uh, last week, and it's a really, really, really special place. So many of our uniformed service personnel live on Staten Island. Staten Island has, I believe, the largest Liberian community outside the country of Liberia in the world. It has the best Sri Lankan food in New York City. It's a diverse, wonderful place. So I think it would be really sad if that ultimately happened. I haven't thought through enough the politics of how this would all happen with the state legislature and with a home rule and all of that, but I wouldn't want to see Staten Island leave uh, the city. We're a city of five boroughs, and I want us to stay that way. Do you think that the council members and I guess other people who support this, do you think there's uh, legitimate reasons for them wanting to leave? I know some of the things that the council members have said, but do you think maybe, I know they always call themselves the forgotten borough, but do you think there are actual issues on that island that would make people say enough and want to be on their own? I don't know. I mean, you know, Staten Island, of course, uh, overall is uh, a little more conservative than the city as a whole. And so sometimes they um, you know, may not be happy about some of the things that's happened that, that, that's happening in the city overall. But 
you know, there are also other pockets of the city that are more conservative as well. And ultimately, we're a city where we uh, respect each other and we coexist peacefully. And the city is uh, still hopefully has great, great, wonderful days ahead of it. So, I mean, I, I don't live on Staten Island, so I don't want to pretend I can speak to those issues or, or pretend that I know all of the feelings that people there might have. But I think it would be a real travesty to lose um, a really wonderful and important borough as part of our entire city. Rich? Uh, I know obviously you don't support that I'm breaking away from the city, but what are your thoughts on actually having a study group which would be uh, feasible or not? I don't know enough about it. I have to talk a little bit more with the council members and with the uh, uh, Staten Island delegation uh, to understand this. Uh, you know, the bill is being introduced, but you know we've seen we've seen what happened before, and ultimately the state legislature I think would need to get involved here, and so um, I have to kind of sit down with the staff and also with the Staten Island delegation and talk all of this through. I haven't done that yet. Emma. Hi. Um, so I want to ask you for the mayor. Oh, welcome, Emma, too. This is my first yes, you were stated. Yes. You know, I support, as I've said, the aims of the bill, but right now the council is looking at how this could impact uh, the entire city and particularly small businesses. Uh, the public advocate, who is the sponsor of this bill, has put an advisory group together that he has convened, and I believe they met yesterday, to talk about some of the issues around this. It's made up of small business owners and also organizations that represent workers. If the council is to act, it needs to be done in the right way and not because of an arbitrary deadline. It's important that we get this right. On other items like uh, minimum wage, the 5 for 15, which I supported, paid sick leave, which I supported, there was data showing that the benefits outweighed potential negative effects. On this, one of the big problems is that there's a significant lack of data, and we are trying to get the data necessary to understand how many people this would impact, how it would impact small businesses, how would it impact certain types of small businesses. That's the type of work that, we need, that we're doing, and we need that data to ensure that we get this right. That's what I'm focused on, working on getting that data with the public advocate and with the other members of the body. And, and, and I don't have a set timeline of actually uh, getting this done. It's about getting the right information and getting it done correctly. I have a respectful working relationship with the mayor, uh, and um, you know we do things uh, as an independent body. When we agree with the mayor, we work with him. When there's disagreement, we try to do it respectfully, not personally, to get things done. You know, I was uh, uh, when I was elected, I talked about I talked about the independence of this body and how we were going to be an independent council, and I think we've shown that over the last almost two years. We're going to continue to do that over the next two years, and we take these issues issue by issue, uh, and, and that's how we're going to continue to be. Andy. The Small Business Survival Act. Yep. Has been around since I think Messenger first. That's right. Yes, that's correct. Uh, Well, we've done a lot on commercial tenant protections. We've done a significant amount. We've done a package of bills on this very issue. But again, it's important that we have the data to get this right, especially when it could have a very significant impact on the city. And so I'll say a few things. I think this issue of commercial vacancy is very complicated. And everywhere you walk around the city, you see 
uh, a streetscape that is dotted by empty storefronts. Now, some of those storefronts are empty because of greedy landlords that have doubled, tripled, quadrupled, quintupled the rent on their local small business, whether it is the shoe repair store or the bodega or the dry cleaner, things that really make up the fabric of a local neighborhood, and we want to protect those places. But there are other factors that are at play here as well, which is property taxes being passed through to these small businesses, which jacks up their rents even further. You have a regulatory system that is overly punitive, and we as a council are looking at ways to potentially help with that, especially when the Department of Consumer Affairs or the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene come in for non-life safety, non-life-threatening issues, and they find these small businesses up the wazoo. And then lastly, what is happening with uh, Amazon and online retailers, and how does that affect small businesses. These series of factors, I think, go into this. One of the problems uh, with the current bill, and we've been working on it, is the bill as written would affect Goldman Sachs in the same way that it would affect a neighborhood bodega. And we're looking at potentially figuring out, can you do this for smaller businesses, for legacy businesses, for businesses that have been there for a certain amount of time, that are under a certain square footage? It's a complicated thing when you have a very diverse um, retail landscape uh, from Brownsville to Soundview to Jackson Heights to Chelsea, it's different neighborhood by neighborhood. And one of the issues might be that there's actually too much retail space on the market right now. And what does that potentially do? So these variety of factors uh, is affecting this, and we're looking at all of those. We passed a series of bills earlier this year on reporting. Number one, getting the number of empty storefronts that exist because we didn't have that. Having a registry where landlords will have to require to register their empty storefronts, and then looking at these other factors. We passed a bill recently cracking down on uh, harassment of small businesses and commercial properties. We're looking at doing all these things while we get the data to look at this bigger issue. I'm deeply committed to it. I hear about it all over the city. On the issue of Sugar Deli in my district on 35th Street and 9th Avenue, my office has been working on this. It's my understanding that the landlord and uh, the owner and operative deli have decided to start to renegotiate, that the landlord has come back to the table, doesn't guarantee that this is going to get done in the right or fair way, but I'm hopeful that uh, with my office's intervention and hopefully getting people around a table, we'll find a solution for this small business. Yeah, Sydney. It's, f it's far too early. You know, the, the, the debate has to happen in the state legislature. Uh, the public has to weigh in on this. I have to talk with the Staten Island delegation before I even consider a home rule measure. Sean? Welcome to my life. <laughs> when you have 50 colleagues you have to work with, there is a diverse set of viewpoints. And I think members have been critical of the mayor in his first term as well when they disagreed with him. So, you know, I think it's natural that potentially in the halfway point of a second term that uh, some people may get a little more critical and a little more confrontational. I have always tried to remain professional, not make it personal, focus on the issues. I've said that since day one in my time here as speaker, that I'm focused on getting the job done for New Yorkers, focused on the big issues that affect New York City, transportation, the housing crisis, public safety, small businesses, schools, all of these issues that matter. That's what I'm focused on. I'm not focused on 
uh, having you know uh, unnecessary fights with the mayor. I'm focused on working on these issues that really matter. You have to ask those council members. Uh, I don't speak for all of them, as you know, uh, given what happens here every single day. Uh, but you know, it, it seems natural that probably every mayor has dealt with this. I don't know what it was like in the last two years of Mayor Bloomberg. I don't know what it was like in the last two years of Mayor Giuliani. But I think naturally these things might happen to any mayor. You know, I, I do things on the merits, and um, I try to build consensus here at the council when possible, and the people that I have to work with on a daily basis are actually the 50 other members here who have priorities, who have districts they're advocating for, who have legislative uh, accomplishments that they are seeking as they're ending their time uh, potentially in city government. Um, you know, I can't speak to Albany. I don't know anyone who can fully explain Albany. Albany is a special thing that, unless you're there and cover it, you may not be able to fully understand. But I'll say that I think you actually saw the legislature this past session act very independently on their own from uh, the executive. And you see the council act independently from the executive. It's part of our job under the city charter and under the state constitution to actually do our job in an independent way, but work with the executive on on things that are part of the state constitution and city charter. In the state constitution, it's the annual budget. In the city charter, it's the annual budget. There are things that we must work together on, but there are also other things where the council is allowed to show independence. That's our oversight. That's our legislative process. That's our final negotiating on land use matters. We're going to continue to do those things. Yes. Uh, I believe we're working on that. So it's my understanding that um, uh, Hazel Dukes from the NAACP, uh, Kirsten Foy, and Reverend Sharpton sent me a letter uh, asking for a working group and, and time to come together to actually talk about this. Uh, I, I'm committed to getting this bill done, but I want to get it done correctly. And so uh, my staff has been all over this working on it. We'll continue to work on it. But again, we're not under an artificial deadline. The most important thing for me is to get it done correctly and properly. And that is why I didn't want it uh, entangled with another bill that I thought really needed to move. Um, so um, we continue to work on it uh, judiciously every single day. Um, I, I don't have a time frame. As soon as we figure out by building consensus with the advocates, with the folks that are worried about criminal justice, with the sponsor of the bill, with the members of the BLC, BLAC caucus, with all the folks here that have weighed in on that, as soon as we ha have that consensus, we'll move forward. Uh, we're not at that point yet. I'm not sure we'll get there before Christmas, so we're probably going to be working on this into the new year. because I'm not sure that the three folks that I mentioned agree with that, that uh, strategy that was laid out in that memorandum to me. And that's why it's important to build consensus. I'm sure there are some things in that memorandum that would work. There are other things that we're going to have to work with the NYPD on. There are other things we're going to have to look at state law on. We're going to have to engage all the stakeholders. We've started that process. We'll continue to do that. I'm grateful that they came up with recommendations and solutions. Again, I'm committed to getting this bill done, but I just want to get it done correctly because of how important and big this bill is. And I think uh, we are now on a path to, to get there with these three important advocates in the room helping work on this. And I want them in the room with the other advocates who sent the memo as well. Everyone should be in the room together, hashing these things out, getting to a point of consensus, and getting to a point where everyone supports the bill. I believe we're doing that, correct? Jeff, are we... We're, So we are looking at convening everyone to have those conversations. That's my hope, um, and, and, and that's what we do on issues that are important and difficult in the council. Uh, Gloria?
I don't know either. Um, has he paid the fine that he was... Is Jim here? I, I believe he has not paid the fine, uh, and we are seeking ways to uh, get that money. There are a variety of ways we could potentially do that. Uh, we could uh, potentially enter into litigation with him to get that. Uh, and there are other remedies that we're looking at. He should pay the fine. Uh, and if he doesn't pay the fine, uh, the case could be reopened and there could be further sanctions against him um, if he doesn't pay the fine. So that's what we're looking at. And have you been able to find a permanent monitor? Yes, we have a permanent monitor. And who is that? Uh, Jim, do you want to say the name? Uh, we're actually finalizing it today. Oh, hopefully. okay, so I don't want to announce it yet. We'll We, we do have a permanent monitor. It's a very, very great person who I think will do a great job. Um, uh, and so I'm glad that this person has agreed to do this um, and they'll be doing it for uh, the entirety of his term. Any hints like a young woman where they come from? Uh, I'd say it's a very well-respected, capable woman who's going to be doing this work. Henry? I think the latter. I mean, the, the in the last two years that I've been here, the legislation we've done has been driven by the council. There have been some um, legislative packages that have been important to the mayor, that were priorities of the mayor, but were also at the same time priorities of the council. So there was an overlap there. Um, but I think you've seen the mayor push on the paid vacation. You've heard my issues with it, that we're trying to work through on it, that the public advocate can be in this group. I'm not sure of any other um, <coughs> priorities that I've heard about. But again, if there are good ideas, we want them. If there are good things that there's going to be agreement on and then are going to move the city forward, um, it's not about uh, having a fight. It's about figuring out what's going to work for the city, how to work constructively together to uh, succeed as a city. Uh, but I don't know of anything else in front of us right now besides that one. Yes, Alex. Um, well, I have a question about the uh, community education council of 22 member, Jeff Cody, uh, racial work against uh, Asian Americans. And last week, the uh, board of the member issued a statement uh, calling to remove her from the council. And would you like to join them, or do you have any comments on that? I think it was. Uh, totally abhorrent, and I was happy to see uh, Council Members Chin, Ku, Deutsch, and Traeger uh, call for the removal. And so, um, you know, there's no place in New York City for uh, making comments that are denigrating towards other uh, groups of people. And, you know, I haven't followed the uh, everyday timeline of it, but uh, if she apologized in the immediate aftermath, maybe that would uh, mean something. I don't know if she has. Has she apologized? She has apologized, but uh, it doesn't satisfy the existing community. No, I mean, what she said was unacceptable. But I think uh, what she said was what I think needs to happen in these moments is hopefully for people to come together and have greater understanding and healing with each other so that people are, are, are given a chance to learn from their mistakes. But I do think that those comments were unacceptable, abhorrent, uh, and they have no place in New York City. But just when that happens, I think you need to go beyond that in the aftermath and hopefully create a situation of reconciliation, healing, understanding, and moving forward. But uh, those comments are, were, were, were abhorrent. But if, uh, but if she refused to do so? She should resign. Uh, yeah. Gloria? A little bit.
I, I honestly don't know enough about it. I'll, 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 I'll get briefed fully by the staff. I heard a little bit about it, but I don't know all the details, so I don't want to rush into comment without understanding exactly what's happening there, uh, talking to the staff and my colleagues here on the council, um, but I'm happy to get back to you on it. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you all very much. Hold on, we'll go to Sean and then we'll go to Gloria. <laughs> yes, Sean, what did you, what'd you say? Just the uh, current events uh, question. Articles of impeachment are out today. The president comes from New York. Could he impeach? What are your, what are your thoughts? The president is a sociopathic, pathologically lying criminal who has broken the law many, many times before he was elected president, and I believe since then. The Congress, I believe, should impeach him. I was happy to see these two articles of impeachment that were introduced uh, by uh, the, the Democratic leadership uh, in the Congress. I hope that there's a real trial uh, in the Senate. There has been all sorts of misdirection from the Republicans you saw in those hearings yesterday, uh, from the president basically having uh, a temper tantrum, tweeting and retweeting over a hundred times on Sunday up until midnight. So, you know, the framers of the Constitution wanted us to be able to protect our democracy. And this is the ultimate way of doing so if someone has engaged in high crimes and misdemeanors. This president sought foreign interference in the 2020 election and asking for uh, Ukraine to participate in going after former Vice President Biden and his son to interfere with the election. And we know that similarly his campaign engaged with Russians and people connected to Russia in the 2016 election. So now we have two times of the president engaging with a foreign power to interfere with American democracy, and that is why Congress is doing it. That is what the basis of the Mueller report was. I am grateful that finally we're taking this step and having some accountability. Uh, we need to get rid of Donald Trump. He is uh, destroying the United States of America, and I am ashamed that he is from our city. Gloria? Okay, I didn't know that. No, I have no plans. Tonight I'm uh, going to a bunch of, like, every night I've been going to holiday parties around the city. Uh, last night I was at a holiday party in Hell's Kitchen, and this wonderful, cute, great 92-year-old constituent walks over and pokes me on the shoulder, and I turn around and I said, hello, ma'am, how are you? And she said, my name is Rose. You know my grandson. I said, who's your grandson? Dan Manorino from PIX11. Wow. Uh, so I can, I'm going to continue to go to holiday parties, uh, and, and that's it. I'm not going to any, uh, any fundraisers uh, for other candidates. So thank you all. Thanks. You didn't tell her Manorino played you in the Circle Show? She knew that. <laughs>